morning. You can say that a little louder. Good morning. Good morning. It's really good to see you and to be in the house of God with God's people. Uh, thank you, Pastor Owen. Um, he didn't mention, but uh, we have a website, the movement.church slash give is where you can give. And we added something new recently where you can give via stocks. We know a lot of people have stocks from companies and those things. It's a brand new system and it's really grateful for it. And so the movement.church slash give, you can give online through check or cash or card, but then also the give stocks is a great way because it's also tax deductible. It doesn't take away the stocks that you would choose to give. You liquidated it a different way. So um, it's a great tool to be able to just to build resources for ministry. And all the money that we uh, collect here, it goes not just to help people in the church for be generous, but also pay salaries, pays rent, helps us do ministry, things like alpha training, food for prayer nights, those kind of outreaches that we've done. And so uh, we're so grateful that we have um, a faithful church that is generous, and uh, we want to continue to be generous because we want to continue to do ministry. So um, I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to continue thinking through the Sabbath with, uh, with you. A little disclaimer, just so you know, in case you hear it or see it, I'm a little bit under the weather. Don't worry. I'm not, well, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not sure if I'm not contagious, but that was like the last week or so. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm getting better, but I'm full of Dayquil and uh, cough syrup. And so if I feel a little bit w- weary, uh, sound drowsy, or if I say things that are not biblical, it's the cough syrup. So uh, <laughs> I feel a little bit tipsy right now. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> uh, I'm joking, kind of. Okay, let's pray. Let's pray to guard our hearts. <laughs> God, thank you again for this space Um, We want to hear from you, God. We want to hear from your word because your word is life. Your word is what created the cosmos. And uh, if your word created the universe, surely your word spoken create new life in us today. So God, would you create new life in us through your living word? Where there is death, where there is decay, where there is uh, burden, where there is despair, would you bring life to our hearts through your word and through the gift of Sabbath as we explore it more in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we're talking about Sabbath, and uh, if you're new and joining us this morning, uh, let me just do some recap on what the Sabbath is. Uh, If you're thinking the closest maybe thing you could think of Sabbath is a day off, a weekend is what we would probably call it in our culture, Uh, but the Sabbath is different. And for the last few weeks, um, kind of through a journey of where I've been, uh, Ruth, the clock is, oh yeah, for the next slide. Thank you, buddy. Um, Kind of where I've been with rest and where I've gone through uh, learning how to live within my limits. Um, We've been practicing the Sabbath as a family for about a year and a half, two years. And it has been something we haven't practiced perfectly, but it has given us um, so much reprieve, uh, has taken burdens off, has caused us to stop and pause for moments. And we needed that. So I don't think I'd be standing here healthy and any bit of health I have uh, if it wasn't for the Sabbath. And so I want us to be able to church, be a church that practices it, not because we have to, because it's a command, but because it is a beautiful invitation into experiencing um, the blessing of God. And so let me do some recap for you if you're just catching up with this. The Sabbath was a special day of rest where God's people would cease toiling. And Pastor Owen talked about this in the call to worship, so beautiful. Cease toiling and enjoy the completion of their work as well as delight in the goodness of God's work. I love those two things. They go together, cease toiling, and then enjoy the completion of their work and delight in the goodness of God's work. When God created six days and he stopped on the seventh and he turned around and said, this is good, and he enjoyed what he created. So resting from work last week, we talked about what resting from work was and how it's not just not going into the office. Most of us don't go into the office on the weekends on our days off. Maybe you're not taking new um, calendar invites and meetings and calls, but it's more than just not going into the office. It is the posture of work and the burden of work and the purpose of work that, we, that God wants us to stop from. Stopping all accomplishing and achieving, that's, these are good things, but the Sabbath is meant for us to stop trying to accomplish things and check off to do this and to do this and achieve Cease from strategizing and striving. You might be the one that loves analyzing and loves planning, but the Sabbath is a time to stop all those things, the forward motion, the pause from productivity and planning. Again, all these things are beautiful things. God's blessed 
the, the gift of work. It, it is a gift to work. Uh, sin did not, um, sin corrupted work for sure. Sin made work heavy, but work was before the fall a good thing. And so we want to work, but if we work all seven days, we will be stuck in this kind of rat race, which is not good for our souls. So before I just enter into what the second part of the lighting looks like, I want to give you just three reasons why we need to stop working. Some are recap, some are just more um, specific. So you would just see why we're entering into this with, with this a, a focus to understand that this is something we're not just going to say, this is the day off, and we're going to just treat it as a day off like the other days off. Like we talked about last week, your vacation might leave you more weary than rested. Anyone ever been on vacation and came back weary? Yes. Raise your hand if you, it's honest. Okay. You day off? You feel rested every single day off you take? No. And we're going into Mondays feeling very exhausted and wondering why the two days that we have off are not working. So why do we need to stop working? Number one, to resist the idolatry and enslavement of efficiency, activity, and consumerism. If you don't stop working, you're in this rat race, in this chain of having to be efficient, having to be constantly active, having to consume things, and God does not design that to be a life-giving experience for your life. And so Sabbath is a resistance against the culture and idolatry of these things. And if you need to break an idol, the best thing to do is to stop in, indulging yourself with this idol. And so resisting it means breaking off from the patterns that it invites you in. Number two, why do we need to stop working? To remember that God, this is so important. I didn't say this last week. To remember that God wants something for us more than he wants something from us. Do you believe that? That God wants something for you more than he wants something from you. If you think God wants something from you, like he needs something from you, then you don't understand the basic necessity of like, the essence of God. God does not need you to do anything. He was fine without creating you. Like he was sufficient. He wasn't lacking. He created you to, to show his goodness and to reveal his love and glory to you and to be in communion. But he does not need something from you. He asks, he asks you to do things. But everything he asks us to do in obedience actually is a blessing for us. So we need to stop working to realize God's not trying to get something from us. He actually has something in store for us. And that the good news of Jesus is an invitation to finally and fully rest from earning. The gospel says that you don't need to keep earning and striving because God has finished the work of salvation in Jesus. So why do we need to stop working to remind ourselves we're not on a treadmill trying to earn God's approval. You don't have to think that you have to twist God's arm to like you more because you do more than the other person. That is not the gospel, or it's not Christianity. And lastly, and this is the, the kind of the takeaway from last week that we're going to shift into this week. Why do we need to stop working? So we can stop treating things as mere tools to use for our gain and to start treating things as gifts from God to enjoy for his glory. When we stop working, we stop treating things as tools. Tools are good things. But if we always see the resources around us and the people and the things around us as tools to use for our gain, to build our life, to build our 401k, to build our pleasure-driven agenda, then we're never going to be able to see them as they truly are, as first and foremost, gifts to receive and enjoy. And what God has created, we talked a lot about mangoes last week, if you remember, is really important. You can look back at the sermon, I'm not sure why mangoes were mentioned so often, but um, we talked about the delight of mangoes and sunsets and all the beautiful redwoods and the, and the things that God has created. They're not just tools. They're beautiful gifts to enjoy, and God wants you to enjoy things um, so that you would glorify him. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Let me start with a quote from Dan Allender. He has a beautiful book on Sabbath. We're going to talk a lot through his book this morning in the scriptures. Many who take the Sabbath, he says, seriously and intentionally ruin it with legislation and worrisome fences that protect the Sabbath but destroy its delight. For many Sabbath keepers, it is a day of duty, diligence, and spiritual focus that renounces play and pleasure for Bible reading, prayer, naps, and tedious religious services that seem designed to suck the air out of the soul. If that is keeping the Sabbath holy, then it's better to break it. 
He goes on to say, the darker option is to ignore it, or perhaps even worse, to think that one is keeping it simply by going to church. For many, the Sabbath has somehow morphed into Sunday, the day of resurrection, and it is fulfilled by attending a religious event called Sunday morning church service. Once that is finished, the day is spent in routine yard maintenance, diversion, and preparation for the coming week. Listen to what he says. It cannot be shouted louder from the rooftops. This is not a Sabbath. This is Sabbath breaking. That is an interesting quote because we often have thought about the Sabbath as something that we just do on Sunday and we go to church and it's the Lord's day. And, and I'm not here to tell you what day a Sabbath is because, again, this is a, a, it's kind of been revised and refreshed through Jesus. And uh, we're not trying to stick down on a Saturday or Sunday or a Tuesday. Our schedules are different. But oftentimes we call the Sabbath Sunday and we go to church and then we, like he says, go back and just do a whole bunch of errands and get ready for the work week. And if that's not Sabbath, then then the question I want to answer today is, what in the world are we meant to do on the Sabbath? If that's not the Sabbath, if it's not focused just on going to church and and then coming home and getting ready for the week or taking a nap, then what are we supposed to do on the Sabbath? If last week we talked about how we're not supposed to work, we're resting from productivity and the burden of trying to accomplish and earn, then this week I want to talk about how do we fill that gap that we're creating. We're stepping away from the hustle, but now what do we do with all this time that we have created? Because if you stop stop working, but then you do other things that are under the guise of work, but we reshift and reshuffle the name, it won't be the Sabbath. Now, I am sad to say in in some light, um, The Bible is very silent when it comes to telling us what we should do on the Sabbath. And I find that very telling. Um, And I know this not because I'm just guessing or I read the whole Bible, even though I've read through it many times. I spent a lot of time um, these last few weeks reading through every reference that the Bible had on Sabbath. And there are a few things here and there on Sabbath on sacrifices and things that landed on the festival of Sabbath. But other than that, the Bible talks more about every time it mentions Sabbath, stop working. And it doesn't tell you what you should do when you stop working. And uh, I think that is very important because if the Bible gave you a whole bunch of rules, I mean, it's good to follow that. But the reason why I think the Bible isn't trying to fill it up with a whole bunch of rules is the purpose isn't to try to do a whole bunch of things in our to-do list. The goal is to stop working. And that's very hard for us, especially in our modern day culture. That is the goal. The goal is to stop working, but there's something else that God wants us to do. And for that, I want you, if you have a Bible, to turn to Psalm 92. This is probably the most telling example of what, um, besides reading some outside, like Jewish writings outside the Bible, extra biblical stuff, this is really telling on what went through Israel's mind when they were taking this one sacred day of rest. And uh, I chose Psalm 92 because the the subtitle is a song for the Sabbath. What does that mean? This is a song that the Israelites would sing on the Sabbath. If you didn't realize this, the Psalms, which is a beautiful book, one of my favorites to read every day, is a, a song book. It's like a hymn book for Israel. This is what they would sing on all different occasions, worship. And uh, Psalm 92 is one of the only psalms that I have found that is referencing a song for the Sabbath. So by reading it, I think we can get a little bit of a glimpse of what the posture is and the activities are for this day. Yes, we're not working, but what else are we supposed to do? Let's look at the first four verses of the song for the Sabbath. What were the people of God singing on the Sabbath? Well, this is what we're going through their mind. Psalm 92, verse 1. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work, that the works of your hands I sing for joy. That is so beautiful. It's so telling of what the activity should be on the Sabbath. What do you get from that? I get that the Sabbath, 
The song of the Sabbath is all about giving thanks to God and rejoicing in who he is to us, the work he has done for us, and what he has created around us. I love that. The song of the Sabbath, it starts out by proclaiming and giving thanks to God and rejoicing in who God is to us, his character, his goodness, the work he has done for us. In Israel's time, it was the exodus. In our time, it is through Jesus Christ, the resurrection, that we're saved by our sin. And then what he has created around us. It's not just who he is and what he has done for us. He's created this whole world that we're supposed to give thanks to and rejoice in. And so if I'm looking at the Sabbath song and I'm thinking, I'm reading through Jewish literature and I'm looking through my own life and looking at the world around us, then I, I am looking at the direction that the Sabbath is about tasting delight, practicing gratitude, and pursuing joy. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a beautiful ta- day off. Our days off, again, are often filled with errands and planning and cleaning the house and doing the dishes and doing all the laundry. And uh, I don't find delight in doing dishes. If you do, bless you. You can come over tomorrow. It is my 12-year uh, wedding anniversary this morning. And um, my wife is home. Yeah, thank you. My wife is home sick with the kids. And uh, there's probably a whole bunch of dishes to be done. So you can go bless us. Um, dishes are not delight. Uh, running errands, I'm not grateful for running errands. Nope, not, not at all. I know we're supposed to be grateful in all circumstances, but I don't think that applies to errands. Um, pursuing joy while doing the laundry, pursuing joy while doing the bills, I think there was a separation that the song of Sabbath shows us that we're chasing joy in God. Let me ask you a question. Does joy and gratitude describe your current days off from work? Supposed to be a silent question, but this joy and gratitude, it's, it's, a, it's a really important question. I ask that because I want you to see the discrepancy be, be, uh, between your version of a day off and God's ideal of a Sabbath. Do you connect the light with the Sabbath? Or is it like Dan said, a religious service you have to attend? Now, I'm not saying that service is bad. This is a beautiful thing to do. But if this is the, the, the climax or the, the full vision of Sabbath, then you're missing it. Can this be a part of Sabbath? Yes, but this is not the full picture of the Sabbath. This is a part of it for sure. But does joy and gratitude describe your current days off from work? So I, I want us to get a better picture of what God has in mind when it comes to the Sabbath. So let's look at this passage, Isaiah 58. This is probably next to Psalm 92, the most clear description of what God's heart is for the Sabbath. He's talking to Israel. He's talking to Israel, and he's talking to them in this manner because they weren't, they weren't following God's heart. They were doing God's actions and rules, but they weren't doing it the way God wanted them to do it. To the point where different, a different point in Isaiah, God says, I hate your worship services. Can you imagine God, if God show, Jesus showed up on Sunday to a church and said, I hate what you're doing this morning. That is what God did to Israel. Because if you know, hopefully you know, just being here doesn't mean it's honoring to God. Like it is, I'm glad you came, but we can do things with the godly things with the wrong heart that actually dishonors God. Like Pastor Owen said, God cares about your heart. The action matters, but God also cares about the heart. And Israel was, was off on how they honored the Sabbath. So this is what God comes in and corrects them by. This is the message version. If you watch your step on the Sabbath, and don't use my holy day for personal advantage. Wow. If you treat the Sabbath as a day of joy and call it a delight, God's holy day as a celebration. If you honor it by refusing business as usual, making money, running here and there, then you'll be free to enjoy God. Oh, I'll make you ride high and soar above it all. I'll make you feast on the inheritance of your ancestor, Jacob. Yes, God says so. Look look, look at this. If you treat the Sabbath day as a joy and call it a delight, God wants you to call the Sabbath a delight. Not a duty, not a rule to keep, 
a delight, a joy, a celebration? Do these words infuse your day off or is it filled with heavy burdens and tasks? I want you to see that this is not some kind of weird off like sentence that God just threw out there or because the message version says it. Joy is a very um, central thing in the life of the people of God. But oftentimes I think we're so busy and so serious that, that we, we don't have time for joy. We see joy as secondary. We see joy as something that might come if we have cool circumstances that line up, but really I don't have time to think about my joy. I gotta obey God, I gotta pay the bills, I gotta show up for work. And I want you to see how important it is to God from God's vantage point that you would enjoy him, that you would take delight in his creation, and that you would actually practice and cultivate a heart of gratitude. I pulled out about eight different references of joy in the Psalms. It's full of references, but I want you just to see uh, an eclectic mix of verses uh, pulled straight from the Bible of what the book of Psalms, the songs they would sing, says about joy. Look at what Israel was singing. I sing and shout for joy. God is my exceeding joy. In your presence is fullness of joy. Oh, I love this one. All my springs of joy are in you. All my sources of joy are in you, God. The meadows and the valleys sing for joy. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. The famous one, delight yourself in the Lord. I wonder, do you enjoy God? Have you thought about that lately? Do you enjoy God? Not just worship him that can be connected, not just like follow him, obey him. Do you think about your joy in God as something that you keep a finger on the pulse of? Or is it just for maybe people who have things put together? Because the psalmist was really clear that they found their joy maximized in who God was. It's not just that the Psalms sing about joy. Jesus promises joy. John 15, the last night before his crucifixion and trial, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you. Stop, full stop. This is Jesus, the one who spoke the world to existence. Jesus, the one who died and resurrected, the perfect son of God, and he's saying that I want my joy to be in you. That's wild. My joy to be in you, and that your joy may be made full. I think it's I think it's honoring to the, the Bible to say that Jesus cares a lot about your joy. Jesus cares a lot about your delight. It's not just a promise from Jesus. It's actually a, a command. Did you know that rejoicing in God is a command? Paul says this multiple times in Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Not a suggestion. Hey, if you feel like it, I know we have different emotions and times. Not if circumstances line up. Rejoice in the Lord always. Do you see joy as a command? Just like rest, the Bible says, strive to enter into the rest. I don't think you should see joy as like this automatic feeling you just get when things are awesome. It's something that we have to cultivate. I said it this way, that it is, it is evident that rejoicing in God is not some secondary afterthought to the Christian life, reserved for ideal circumstances, but rather a primary characteristic and practice to cultivate. Do you see rejoicing in God as that central, like the furnace of your affections and your heart is joy in God. I'm talking about the kind of joy that you can have in God when everything else is crumbling around you. I'm talking about that kind of joy. What I'm not talking about is glib happiness. What I'm not talking about is frivolous emotion. What I'm not talking about is feeling good because things are going good. Because how many of you know life doesn't always go good and go the way you want it to? So does that mean when life doesn't go the way we want it to, we don't take joy in God? No, no, no. 
It has to mean something different then. This must mean that the joy that we can have in God is actually above and outside of what we feel in the circumstances. The joy we have in God is not based on what circumstances we're going through. It's rooted in who God is and how good he is. Last week we said that we can't just treat God as useful. We don't worship God because he's useful. We worship God because he is good to us. And his goodness causes us to love him more. I love what C.S. Lewis says. It's a longer quote, but at the end of the quote, he says this. You might know this quote. Joy is the serious business of heaven. Think of that for a second. Joy is the serious business of heaven. If heaven had a, an agenda, it is joy. Joy is the serious business of heaven. In 1647, uh, a group of different churches in, in Scotland, different um, sections of the church in Scotland and around there in England, came together to put together the Westminster Catechism. You might know that, the Westminster Catechism. You know the short catechism. We use that for our kids on Sundays. And it's a question and answer response, understanding doctrine and who God is. It's been around for almost 400 years. And the, number, the first question is the, the most important question. What is the chief end of man? What is the main thing that man is created for? What are you and I supposed to do in our lives? And the way that it answers is, says this, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. I love what John Piper does. He changes the and to by. He says to glorify God by enjoying him forever. I don't know if you know John Piper. You don't need to know him to know that he... He has crafted this sentence that I, I think about so often. It's been so impactful in my life. And, and it goes something like this. He says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. If you want to glorify God, we talk about glorify God as like praising God and worshiping him. But have you ever thought about worship and glorifying God connected to your joy in him? That you can glorify God by enjoying him. In fact, he is most glorified, most shown to be worthy when you are finding your full satisfaction and delight in him. It's the same example as, let's say I go home to my wife. She's not watching because we don't have live stream, so I can plan this out right now. I've been sick all week on a bed, but I gotta come home and I'm gonna buy her flowers after this and surprise her at home. Let's say I came home and got her flowers and I said, hey, babe, here, here's these flowers. Uh, I love you. And uh, I, I love you so much. You make me feel so happy. You make me feel so joyful. Do you think she would say, Chris, you're so selfish. All you're thinking about is how I make you feel. Really? Like you're talking about my 12 year anniversary and you're just saying I love you because you make me feel so happy. Look at you again as being so selfish. No, she's not gonna say I'm selfish because I'm talk talking about my delight in her. She's gonna feel so honored because I said, Babe, I love you so much. You make me feel so awesome. You make me feel so uh, happy. You make me, you, you increase my joy. And why would she feel honored? Because I'm finding my joy in her. And she, she brings me happiness. Why would it be any different for God? We're not saying, God, we just love you because of how you make us feel. God is beautiful and we get to enjoy him. And he's so honored when we find our joy in him. And so the question we have to answer is how does the Sabbath help us cultivate joy in God? If you and I were created to find joy in God and delight in God and to be happy in God, come on, I mean, last week we talked about weary, exhausted Christians are a poor apologetic to the world. The Bible says we're supposed to be salt and light. Weary, exhausted Christians are broken and busted lights and salt that have no taste. And I'm not saying that you should feel bad for being exhausted. That's most of my life, this last couple of years, I feel exhausted. But I try to do things that rejuvenate my heart and my soul so that I can find joy in God. The same way I would say joyless Christians are not a good apologetic to God in this world. 
I'm not saying happy because your circumstances are aligned, but joyless. Again, joyless being deeper. How does the Sabbath help us cultivate joy in God? I was thinking through this, and I think it's, it's simple but also profound. If we're always living beyond our limits with little margin, we're not honoring the Sabbath, we're always working in some kind of way or fashion, we're living beyond our limits with little margin, our packed schedules and constant stimulation will suffocate the seeds of joy and wonder that need time and space to take root and grow. If you're always busy, if you're constantly stimulated by your phone and emails and TikTok and media and movies and things and, 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 and things to do, then the joy and the wonder that God wants from you and that God wants you to find in him are gonna be suffocated. They won't have room to grow. What I'm saying is that the Sabbath, therefore, becomes a way to practice rejoicing in God by setting aside time to receive God's gifts of love with hearts of gratitude and delight. If you're always busy doing things, you're stuck in a constant posture of earning and performing. The Sabbath calls you away from doing things so that your hands are pried open so that you receive God's gifts with gratitude and love. And that invokes joy and wonder in God. Because this is all about how you see God. Is God just something useful for you to get something, or is God beautiful to you? Of course God is useful, yes and amen. But is he also beautiful to you? Is he worthy? Is he good? Can you find joy in him? Or is he just functional? Because if he's just functional, you won't worship him like he wants to be worshipped or like you were created to be worshipped. But he was, because you're thinking that he's just a means to an end. But if you say, like the psalmist says, all my joys find their source in you, God. Like, I love pizza and sex and movies and Lord of the Rings and all these things are great. And, and they bring me joy, but my deepest joys are in you, God. I would say, I'd venture to say that's the heart of a Christian. A Christian says, I love this world because God created it, but my deepest joy is in God. So what are we meant to do on the Sabbath? Back to our question. If the Sabbath cultivates gratitude and wonder by giving it space to actually enjoy what God has done for us. Again, if you're so busy, how are you going to be able to remember the gospel? How are you going to be able to remember the gospel if you're constantly trying to perform on a rat race of this world? You will not, you'll find it very difficult to do so. So God says, I want you to stop so you can ponder and enjoy what I have done for you. So what are we meant to do on the Sabbath? How can you order your Sabbath to find joy in God? But Dan Allender has another quote that's really helpful in thinking about a filter for our Sabbath. He says this, the only parameter that is to guide our Sabbath is delight. Here's some questions he ponders. Will this be merely a break or a joy? The thing you're gonna do on the Sabbath, is it just a break? Or is it a joy? Will this lead my heart to wonder or just routine? Will I be more grateful or just happy that I got something done? Wow, profound questions. Such helpful questions to filter through the Sabbath. The only parameter that is to guide our Sabbath is delight. I'm going to do something on this next slide that uh, is dangerous because um, the Bible doesn't tell you what to do on the Sabbath. I think that's on purpose because God wants us to light. And I'm not telling you this because they're train tracks you have to follow. But here's just some examples of things that I think you can do on the Sabbath that I have done that cause you to rejoice in God. And uh, you're going to notice a pattern. Getting lost in a compelling story. Maybe you read your favorite book on the Sabbath. Dirtying your hands in your garden talking to me and Jana a couple weeks ago and they were working on their garden on Saturday and some of you getting your hands dirty and working in your garden if you have one is not delightful. You don't enjoy that. So the filter becomes so important. Like last week we talked about it's not the activity as much as the purpose. So what is the purpose behind it? Maybe for you getting in your garden is gonna actually love, it cause you to love God more because you're appreciating his creation. Sharing a delicious meal with a dear friend. Going on a hike by yourself in silence. Bringing out your best wine for dinner. Cuddling with your kids and laughing. Singing a psalm together as a family. 
Do you see these things as things that are actually beautiful and delightful and things that you are allowed to do, and not just allowed, encouraged to do on the Sabbath? Or would you feel guilty doing these things on the Sabbath? You might do them on a day off in some kind of way, but again, the way we frame how we do things is really important. But filling a day with, with experiences that increase your joy and not feeling bad for it. He, he mentions this, I don't have it quoted here, but it struck me, he mentions this in his book. He says, the war that we battle in the Sabbath is not so much about, and the obstacles aren't so much with our schedules and our busyness, it is with our belief that God actually wants to give us something as good as this gift. That's the real war. The real war isn't the schedules and the business. That's, that's the, the level war. The deeper war is stopping to believe that God thinks we're worthy enough or lovable enough uh, to actually be, be honored by this gift and to be given this grace and to be poured over with joy. Here's just another couple of questions that help you filter through. Will it increase worship? Whatever you're gonna do on the Sabbath, will it increase worship? And I want you so, Take this with, with a grain of salt, but you understand hopefully what I'm saying, that if you just view worship as just going to church or reading your Bible, uh, you're going to have a hard time living a life of worship because your life includes much more than just going to church or reading your Bible. Are these great sources and encouragements and fuels for worship? Yes, I would say start with the Bible. But the life that we live has to include more in, in our view of worship. Will it induce wonder and awe? Will it help me enjoy God's creation? Will it help me experience God's love? What a question to, to ponder when you're thinking through the Sabbath. Is this activity that I'm gonna enter into, will it help me experience God's love and appreciate his love for me? And then to stop and receive that and not feel bad that you're not doing anything to earn or move anything forward, but you just enjoy God's love, because God loved you before you loved him. And lastly, will it stir up gratitude? Increase worship, induce wonder, help me enjoy God's creation, experience God's love. Now, I want to give a warning. The worst thing you can do is turn this freedom into a burden by making regulations and stipulations. The worst thing you can do for the Sabbath is to take this, wow, I'm supposed to delight and enjoy God and reduce it down to a whole bunch of rules on what you can do and cannot do. I think that is one of the reasons why the Bible is pretty silent on how we're supposed to treat the Sabbath and why Jesus' main uh, issue with the Sabbath with Israel was that they kept adding a whole bunch of rules that they didn't need to add. That's why earlier we said this, but Jesus says in Mark 2, I think, he says the Sabbath the man was not created for the Sabbath. As in, man was not created to do all the requirements of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created as a gift for man. We know that Jesus is the Lord of the harvest, but do you know Jesus is also the Lord of the Sabbath? He calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. I mean, he's over the Sabbath. It's a good thing, and he wants you to find freedom. Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack anything. He leads me beside still waters into green pastures. So I want you to think through that as you filter what you can or cannot do to take away the, the legalism that you're gonna be tempted to add. Resist legalism and embrace the green pastures and still waters. If you were to read some of the books in the Jewish literature that I read this last month or so on the Sabbath, you would blush at what they are talking about. Because they are saying to go full out, basically party mode on the Sabbath. And not in a, a crazy way, like you might think partying, this culture, but in a way that fills your cup with delight and joy. Unashamed wonder. And I think if I'm honest, if we were talking in a, in a, in a room just with you and I, some of us have a problem with that. How can we just waste a day away just, just frolicking around enjoying life? And I would say, uh, God did not create all of this so that you can just have your head down working. He created it to be enjoyed. 
He created you so you can enjoy it. And as we're going to see as we close, the Sabbath is supposed to be a foretaste of the coming joy when all we will do is enjoy God and his creation and his works together. So one, one Jewish scholar said, if you cannot find it in yourself a, a, an ability to delight in God and his creation for a day, you're going to have a hard time when heaven comes. Let me tell you, heaven is the unending Sabbath. You cease from toil and you enter into rest and you delight in God. And so the, what Sabbath is, is practicing eternity now. Sabbath is practicing eternity now. It is practicing what we're going to be doing for eternity. And that is a beautiful gift to enjoy. So I want to do this. I want to give you a picture as we close of what our Sabbath looks like at our home. It's not perfect. It's often messy. It's uh, not always the same. But this is some pictures. I take a lot of pictures anyways. But I wanted to document last week's Sabbath as we were going through it. None of it was planned except for the first slide you're going to see. And uh, this is what Sabbath can look like for you, but with the disclaimer that we have kids. Okay, so if you don't have kids, um, you can do things maybe a lot different. We have kids, so we, we, we revolve our Sabbath around that, even though we have our own time with mom and dad time and our own time. But let me just work you through a couple pictures you're going to see on here and explain what Sabbath looked like for us. This first picture is a picture of a candle and uh, honey and a book. The book we have is a gift we got from uh, uh, Practicing Practicing the Way, and it's a a compilation of Jewish prayers and poems about the Sabbath. So what we're trying to do on the beginning of Sabbath, ours is Monday, is Monday morning. We're going to try to do it Sunday night, but Monday morning last week, we lit the candle, had the kids light the candle, uh, represent that God is light and the start of a Sabbath. This is different than the other six days. And then we had them have a spoonful of honey. Now, why would you do that? Um, because back in, in, in ancient Israel time, the fathers and mothers would give their kids a spoonful of honey on the Sabbath to remind their kids to understand that the Sabbath is sweet. And so we want our kids to know the Sabbath is not a burden, it is sweet. And our son had it, if you know how he's crazy, he got that so fast that a little couple, couple hours later, we were telling him, like, either we're gonna do some school tomorrow and you gotta clean up your, your room today. And he was like, Ah, the Sabbath is sweet, but this is bitter. <laughs> and I was like, yep, you got it, buddy. Six days of bitterness and one day of sweetness. <laughs> so we want our kids, so we started with a prayer, a simple prayer. We talked about what Sabbath is. We talk intentionally about Sabbath. We frame our time so we're not just doing the random stuff. We let our kids know what we're doing. And they know, they, they look forward to it. So we started with that. Next thing we did after breakfast is something super spiritual. Played a game of Catan. We have a kid's version of Gatan, but Haddon was feeling really uh, frisky that day, so he wanted to play the adult version of Gatan, and he almost won. Oh my gosh, I was so embarrassed. He almost won. I came through at the end with two victory points hidden, and I beat them, and then we rubbed it in my son's face. That talk about delight, maximizing delight. Oh, I just like, boom, Haddon. Uh, but uh, we played we played Gatan. For, that's a long game. Y'all know Gatan. It's not a short game, especially with kids. Okay, pick up your grain. Come on, hurry up, move it. Like, get the, get, the, get the wood. Okay, gosh, here you go. Here's four wood. Just take it. <laughs> so we're playing. But it was so fun. It was laughing and, and competition. Next thing we did, thanks to AJ and Serena, they gave us uh, Summer a gift of uh, this hymn book of piano lessons. And we got a piano a couple months ago. And so my wife, and, and you know my wife's still in a robe, where Jamie's, uh, in the morning after breakfast in the game, they were playing and learning nothing but the blood of Jesus together. And uh, I snuck us out of there and, and got a pick. And I was reading a book and had it was playing Legos at that time. Uh, next thing you did, this is even more spiritual, is uh, we played Mario Kart 8. Mario Kart 8. Um, this is a really good family bonding game if you don't have it. Uh, brings out a lot of competition. But it's a great opportunity for us to come together and, and to enjoy. The kids love it. And, um, and so we did that for a little bit. Uh, and then we took a break and had some really good food. Uh, Britt makes awesome charcuterie charcuterie boards. I don't know how to say it. It's too fancy for me. But uh, it looked awesome and it tasted awesome. And so we try to bring out really good food, not fancy. Uh, and, and this is not ide- idealized. We had to do a lot of work to enter into this. We spent a lot of time on Sunday cleaning the house, 
for, went shopping beforehand and we prepped breakfast beforehand so that we could enter the Sabbath not doing a whole bunch. The Jewish tradition was that there was a day of preparation. There still is a day of preparation in Israel on Friday. If you go to Israel now on Fridays in the evening and afternoon or afternoon, you will see people running around at the markets and they're super busy getting everything they need for Saturday Sabbath. And they're prepping everything Friday so that Saturday doesn't have to be a day of doing all the errands. They've done them so that they can actually have a sacred day of rest. I don't know how this picture got in there, but we, I went to my room, I was reading a book, and they hopped onto the bed, and I had to capture a picture of it. They, they didn't know I had a camera, but they're like, had it in the summer, like, let's stare up in the ceiling. It's Sabbath. We're supposed to rest. And I was like, that's not delightful, but whatever. So they wanted to like cuddle in bed and stare at the ceiling and they were just like, Haddon was farting and I don't know what was happening. So, uh, but we had a beautiful time cuddling under the covers. And then this is, wasn't last week, but we do this often. Um, this is up the street from our house, really close in Oakland, is a Leona Canyon and it's full of a river and hike. And so we often go hiking in the Redwoods for like an hour or so, pretty light and chill. But to get out in creation and to enjoy God's, creation. That, that's a normal Sabbath day, and that's not a lot. That isn't, it's not burdensome to turn on a game or to eat good food, and, and maybe some Sabbaths we're just on the couch because we're exhausted and we're resting and listening to an audible story. Um, but I want you to see, you know, your Sabbath doesn't have to look like mine. These brought me joy. It was so, especially because Tuesday I got sick. I've been on the couch all day, all week, that it was such a joy to actually have Monday as a Sabbath, the delight in God. At the end of the day, my heart felt so full. Heart felt so full because I, I was able to see that those things were actually helping me love God more. How could you say that, Chris, that Mario Kart and Catan and uh, piano could do that? Well, let me, let me read you a verse. Romans eleven thirty six. For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. Everything comes from God and exists by God and is intended for God. I take that everything to mean everything. Everything is not evil. I'm pretty sure Catan and Mario Kart aren't evil. Everything in this world that is good comes from God, exists by God, and is intended for God. So let me just end with this thought. When you realize that everything was created by God and for God, a short walk in the Redwoods, a competitive game of Catan, a platter of Trader Joe's cheeses, all of it can become a pillar of redemptive remembrance, a portal of praise where we taste our future joy, a gift from our loving Father to be opened. The Sabbath is a pillar, a portal, and a gift. The Sabbath is a pillar of And the pillars were altars that people would put up to remember what God has done. And so when I'm enjoying Trader Joe's unexpected cheddar, praise the Lord. When I'm enjoying a game of Catan and hearing my seven-year-old and 10-year-old laugh, when we're reading a psalm together and praying for five minutes, when I'm enjoying a good song or food, I'm also remembering that God loved me so much that he gave me the gift of Jesus. When I'm enjoying these things, I'm also understanding it's also a portal that one day I'm going to taste all this in heaven forever. And this is a glimpse of that. And I get to practice eternity and enter into it and and anticipate that coming day when Jesus comes back to make all the sad things come untrue. I get to taste that on the Sabbath. And it's also a gift, a gift from our loving Father to be opened. And as you know, the gospel is a gift by grace, not by works. So God wants us to open our hands and receive the gift that God has for us. And Sabbath helps us align our hearts to the goodness of God's character. What should you do on the Sabbath? Stop working and maximize your joy in God and his creation. Stop working and maximize your joy in God and his creation. You might have a whole bunch of questions. How am I gonna do this? What is it count? All the... What, what, how do I do this with kids and this stage and this thing? And what if I don't have a full day? It's not the place and time for those kind of questions. We are building out a website that has more resources. And we're going to try to do like a, either a Zoom call or a workshop to answer questions and work through ideas. But I'm not preaching this series because it's a good idea. I'm preaching it because, one, I've lived this life and I'm trying to live it even more. Our staff has for the last year and a half practiced Sabbath. And I want you, if you're not doing it, to honor the Sabbath, to practice it. Not because it's a command, but I think because it will help you love and enjoy God more. 
So we want to be serious about practicing this well. And so as last week we did, I want you to turn to your neighbor and, and take a few minutes and answer this question, same question as last week. How does this change the way you view and approach the Sabbath? How does thinking about it as a day to delight and find your joy in God and to receive his love, how does that change the way you think about your days off, whatever you call it, or the day of Sabbath? How does that change the way you will approach it? And uh, after you gather and share, make sure to have a few moments to pray over each other, just to pray that, uh, a prayer of gratitude for this gift, and then we're going to worship and receive communion. So seven minutes on the clock, uh, turn to your neighbor, let's Take a few moments to share and practice this by making this real in our life, and then we'll come back and worship after.